dari keluarga Batak yang sangat sederhana membuat saya insecure dan yakin bahwa uang, kesuksesan adalah sumber kebahagiaan. Lulus kuliah, saya berangkat ke Jakarta untuk mengubah nasib. Saya pikir akan mudah, tetapi ternyata sulit sekali. Saya down dan hal itu membuat saya belajar Alkitab lewat sepupu saya. Tuhan melembutkan hati saya dan saya memutuskan untuk jadi murid. Beberapa bulan kemudian, saya dapat pekerjaan yang biasa jauh dari pekerjaan impian saya. Tidak seperti kebanyakan orang yang berubah drastis setelah belajar Alkitab, butuh bertahun-tahun untuk saya bisa mengerti cara pikir dan cara kerja Tuhan. Saya masih tetap ambisius untuk mendapatkan pekerjaan impian, tapi selalu gagal. Hingga akhirnya saya lelah memutuskan untuk berhenti dan puas dengan pekerjaan yang ada. Tapi saat itulah Tuhan justru memberikan pekerjaan impian saya, bahkan tanpa saya apply sama sekali. Dan hal ini membuat saya kagum akan Tuhan. Dalam pekerjaan saya, ada beberapa situasi yang membuat saya harus melakukan hal yang tidak benar, seperti menerima uang suap dan sebaliknya. Sebagai orang yang sekuritinya pada uang, hal ini tentu saja membuat saya tergoda. Saya struggle dan saya merasa kok sulit banget ya untuk melakukan hal yang benar. Kalau pekerjaan ini membuat saya berdosa dan jauh dari Tuhan, saya tidak mau pekerjaan ini. Lewat doa dan dukungan dari komunitas, akhirnya saya berani mengungkapkan keyakinan saya kepada atasan saya. Ajaibnya dia menghargai dan tidak memaksa saya melakukan hal yang tidak sesuai dengan keyakinan saya. Lewat pekerjaan, saya belajar untuk menaruh rasa aman saya pada Tuhan, bukan pada uang, pekerjaan, perusahaan bagus, ataupun pujian dari manusia. Saya merasa aman karena saya berjalan bersama Tuhan. My name is Lenny and this is my turning point. Selamat pagi saudara-saudari, selamat datang di Kebaktian Online GKDI Jakarta. Sebelum kita memulai kebaktian kita, akan ada beberapa pengumuman yang bisa kita perhatikan berikut ini. Sebentar lagi kita akan memulai kebaktian online kita. Mari kita mempersiapkan hati untuk memuji dan menyembah Tuhan. Lord, help me know you promised you'd be with me, Lord. 
the Lord When the world gets tough Filled with broken hearts But my love won't fail Says the Lord oh, oh, oh. When the mountains fall And the sea turns around But my words stand strong Says the Lord When the world gets tough Feel the broken heart But my love won't fail Says the Lord Your love is powerful Me shall grow Your love is mighty Selamat pagi, selamat hari minggu, brothers, sisters, jemaat. Uh, semoga tahun baru ini sudah memulai dengan baik buat kalian. Walaupun kita masih di dalam pandemi ini, kita masih bisa berfellowship dan bisa uh, bertumbuh bersama secara online. Saya sebetul, sebetulnya sangat mau berkhotbah hari ini di dalam bahasa Indonesia. Tetapi, saya sadar bahwa Biasanya saya pakai bahasa Indonesia untuk bahasa basi. Bahasa Inggeris kita bilang small talk aja. Dan kalau saya mau bicara tentang topik yang dalam dan rohani, saya takut semuanya di sini akan menjadi bingung. Dan mungkin harus pakai subtitles untuk benerin semua kesalahan yang saya akan bikin. 
Jadi saya akan lanjut di bahasa Inggris dan saya mau translation di bawah. So the theme this month is no other foundation. That's what we're learning about uh, in the month of January as a church. And it's a great theme to kick off the new year. Why? Because we are all building something in our spiritual lives. The passage that is the theme passage for, for this month is 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul is saying um, that we are actually a temple. Let's read this passage together. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred. And you together are that temple. Wow. Paul is saying that we as the church, as followers of Jesus, we become God's temple. That's why the, the sermon today is we are the temple. Because that's what Paul is trying to get us to see, that we're God's building. We're God's temple. God's spirit dwells within us. And together we become God's presence on earth. Isn't that an incredible thought to think about? You know, if we've grown up in the church or maybe we've come from a background of, of Christianity, I think we're quite used to hearing this concept that we are the temple, uh, that the body is a temple. And sometimes we use that to justify living healthily. Oh, don't smoke. Uh, don't eat bad food. Don't eat junk food because the body is a temple and we must respect the temple. And that's true. That's absolutely uh, correct. And I, I agree with that. But sometimes we fail to grasp just how amazing a concept this is, just how amazing a reality this is for us, that God has made us the temple of his spirit, that God has made his home in your heart. Sometimes we fail to grasp the significance of that. And I think Paul is trying to get the disciples to actually think about the physical temple. He's trying to draw us back to the physical temple that existed at the time of Jesus and indeed for a thousand years before that. Because if you look at the passage in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, and there's a little hint there to the Old Testament where Solomon is building the temple. If we look over at 2 Chronicles chapter 9, it says, the servants of Hiram and the servants of Solomon brought gold from Ophir. They also brought algum wood and precious stones. The king used the algum wood to make steps for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. Nothing like them had ever been seen in Judah. There's this hint of Solomon building the temple from Paul's passage. Now, for us today, for us to really understand the significance of what it means that we are the temple, I think what would be helpful for us is to go back and explore what was the temple the physical temple all about? What was the significance of the physical temple? And to do that, I want us to put on our Jewish lenses for a second as we go back to the Old Testament. Maybe I should say our Jewish sandals and our robes. And we're going to go back and we're going to put ourselves in the position of a Jewish person living in the first century. And we're going to ask a few questions to try and understand what's the temple all about? Why does this matter to us today? And how should I respond? These are the questions that I hope for us to explore. But let's consider the question, how did a Jewish person view the temple, view the physical temple, this huge physical building in the heart of Jerusalem? 
Perhaps we may think that they viewed it the same way that we might view a great religious building. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, I'm from the UK and uh, I actually went to school in Winchester. And Winchester is a town in England that's famous for its cathedral. It has one of the largest cathedrals in all of Europe that dates back as far as around 650 years after Christ. And if, we, if you look inside it, it's a place of great beauty, great majesty, great splendor. And when you go into a building like this, it's meant to remind you of how great God is. Its scale is meant to remind you of how huge God is. But I think for many of us, when we think about a building like this, we often view it as you know, a great piece of architecture or a great landmark. And I wonder, is that how the Jews viewed the temple? Well, maybe it was something they were proud about. Maybe it was a landmark, but it was something so much more than that. It was something so much more profound than that. Why? Because for a Jewish person, a Jew believed that the temple was the very presence of God. This was God's dwelling place. Now, God was not limited to the temple. Jews did not believe that God could be contained in the temple. But if you ask them, where does God really dwell? Where does God really live? It's in the temple. In other words, the temple is where heaven and earth meet. The temple was so special. It was so uh, sacred to Israel that when other nations were attacking Israel, such as the Babylonians, the, their ultimate goal was to get to Jerusalem and destroy the temple. Because if they destroyed the temple, in their view, they think they've destroyed Israel's God. The temple was so special and so sacred that when Jesus said, I will destroy this temple and in three days I will build another not made with human hands. That statement was used as evidence to put Jesus to death. That's how sacred the Jews viewed the temple. The temple is where you really worship God. You truly worship God in the temple. That's where you go to sing, to praise him, to learn about him, to offer your tithes and your offerings. That all takes place in the temple. Look at what God says about the temple in, in, the, in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 9. It says, When Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. God said this about the temple. Can you see why the Jews viewed the temple with such reverence and respect? God says my eyes and my heart will always be there. Let's look at Solomon's temple. Let's look at a diagram of his temple. Now, it kind of looks a little bit like a basketball court. Some of you are thinking, maybe this is a basketball court. I don't remember the rabbis shooting hoops and playing king of the temple court. This is not a basketball court. This is the temple. And if we look at the left-hand side of the image, we see what's known as the court of Israelites or the outer court. And here, any Jewish person, whether, whether man, woman, or child, assuming they were of, of good standing, they were respectable, could enter into this place. Outside of this area was the court of the Gentiles. So if you were not Jewish, you could still come to the temple, but you could not enter. Um, and in the background of the temple courts, there was, this, uh, these, there was these pillars called Solomon's Colonnade. And we see that in the Bible. Uh, here Jesus taught and he was almost stoned by the religious leaders in John chapter 10. It was also the place in Acts chapter 3 where Peter and John were walking and someone who they healed came back to find them in Solomon's colonnade. You know, over in the temple courts, this is where rabbis would sit and those rings there are steps. And often rabbis would sit on those steps and teach about God. That's the place actually where Jesus as a 12-year-old boy was found by his parents discussing and asking questions with the rabbis to learn more. And they were amazed at Jesus's wisdom and his understanding. So when we think about the outer court of the temple, you know, this is a place 
where you get a taste for how amazing God is. This is a place where you ask questions and you learn and you develop an awe of who God is. So let's take it back to us for a second. We are the temple. How are you doing in being the temple? Do people get a taste for how amazing God is in your life? Now your life doesn't have to be so amazing for people to see how amazing God truly is. I remember that when I was still seeking for truth before I became a disciple, when I was getting to know the church, one thing that really inspired me about the follower of Jesus was their authentic joy. Uh, my very first mentor as a disciple, the person who helped me to grow spiritually, was actually a brother from the Middle East who was living in London. And he had been in a severe accident that paralyzed him from the waist down. And he would forever be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. But there was something so infectious about his joy. The way that he shared about God, the way that he shared about what God is doing in his life, that somehow just inspired joy in my heart. That even in the midst of his, his difficulty, his situation, that he cannot change, he was still so joyful in his relationship with God. I wonder for us here, as the temple, in the midst of a pandemic, can people still see authentic joy in your life? Can people see where you find real security, real hope, real joy, that there's something different about your life, that what you worship deep down in your heart is just different. It's not the things of this world. I wonder, can people see that in our lives? Are you a temple for your family? Are you bold enough to have conversations with your family? I know for me, I've been trying to study the Bible with my, my mother for 10 years now, since I became a disciple. And one thing that I've realized is sometimes I'm more confident with people that I don't know, and I'm less confident with people that should actually know me best, my own family. And I've been praying for faith and I've been persevering. And only last year was I able to do the first Bible study with my mother over a video call. And I'm still persevering. I'm still praying. I'm still being patient to see if God can use me to be a temple for my parents. Because who knows, maybe I am the only temple that they'll get to experience. How are you doing in being the temple? Let's go back to our diagram for a sec here. Now, as we go up from the outer courts, from the, from the temple courts, we go up the steps, we go through the door and we reach the altar. This is a different place. This is a more sacred place. You could not just go into the altar if you were any Jewish person. Only the head of the family, the male head, and perhaps the male eldest son could go to the altar. And you would bring your lamb, or your sacrificial animal, and you would confess your sins to the priest. And you would ask the priest to make that sacrifice for you. This was a more sacred part of the temple. Over here, we're getting closer to the holy place. And the Holy of Holies, where God's Spirit himself dwells. You know, there's something interesting we learn about the temple, which is that the closer you get to God's presence, the fewer and fewer people that can actually be allowed to get there. You know, we start off on the outside with the Gentiles. There's a the court of women. Then there's the court of the Israelites. Then as you go through to the altar, just the male heads of the family. Then as you get to the holy place, only the Levite priests which were priests from a certain tribe of Israel that God um, commanded them to serve in this place. And the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could enter and only once a year. What is this? Is God being elitist? Is God saying only the coolest, only the holiest can get into my presence? Or actually, is God trying to teach us something about the nature of being in his presence? You see, you could not just have unfiltered access to God's presence. You could not just waltz casually from the outer court into the altar and into the holy place. That was not how God wanted you to treat his presence. You know, the Jews actually knew this very well from the stories of Abraham, from the stories of Moses, from their scriptures. The Jews knew that the presence of God was something that needed to be handled with great care. 
Moses even talked about how you cannot see God's face and survive. To see God's presence, to see his glory was something so majestic, so overwhelming, that you as a sinful person could not actually live through that. You could not process that. I wonder for us today, if we are the temple, when we gather together, if we are the temple of God's spirit as well, do we handle God's presence with such care? What is our attitude towards coming to church, for example, especially now that we're online and, and we're doing things over Zoom and, 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 and on live streaming? What's our attitude towards attending church? Is it 10 minutes before the service starts, we get out of bed. Should I get changed? Should I keep my pajamas on? Should I turn the camera on? Let me just, let me just show my face. Let me not show my pajamas. Let me watch it from bed. In fact, let me turn my camera off. Should I fellowship after church? Uh, nah, I don't think so. Is that our attitude towards church right now? Is that how we view coming into the temple of God's spirit? What's our attitude towards our quiet time, towards personally meeting with God in our personal time with him? Is that your attitude towards meeting with God? It's, let me see if I have time. Uh, let, let me see whether I feel motivated enough to do that. Uh, I can make time for God later. Is that our approach to spending time in God's presence? Or is it, let me prepare my heart. Let me get up. Let me get ready. Let me, let me pray. Let me have a quiet time. Let me get my morning coffee. Let me be alert. And let me prepare to come into the presence of God and be moved by his presence. You know, this is a sacred space. It may not feel that way because we're online. But when we gather together, Jesus says, when two or more gather in my name, I am there with them. This is a sacred space when we gather together. Are we treating it as such? We need to appreciate how awesome a thing it is to be able to have a community where we can be in the midst of God's presence, where we can come together and God's spirit can dwell amongst us. Now, why is it such an amazing thing to be in God's presence? I was just talking about how God's presence is so holy that if you're a sinner, you might be burned up in God's presence. Why would you want to be in God's presence then? That's a good question. Well, there's something about the temple that a Jewish person also deeply understood. And it's something that we've mentioned already, which is right at the center of the temple, right at the, the heart of the temple, sits this huge elevated stage with a ramp coming off to one side that's called the altar. And the altar was a very significant part of the temple. Why? Because it was at the altar that you understood something very fundamental about who God is. That God is a God of acceptance and forgiveness. That even as you approach his presence, even as you're coming closer to the holy place, you learn that God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. That God is waiting to accept you. That's what happens at the altar. The altar is a place of complete forgiveness and freedom, not judgment, not condemnation. That's the only thing that happens at the altar. Forgiveness, sacrifice, mercy. That's the only outcome. This is where you experienced God's kindness. As you're approaching God's presence, his holiness, you're confronted with this altar, which is the seat of God's mercy. One of my favorite authors is a, is a person called Richard Foster, who wrote a book called The Celebration of Discipline. It's a book on spiritual disciplines. And he said, at the heart of God is a desire to give and to forgive. That is the heart of God. He is a God who forgives and he gives. You know, the altar is a place where the unworthy is made worthy. Something flawed, something unholy, something unacceptable goes to the altar. And in its place, something valuable, something innocent, which was the sacrifice, was made rejected and unworthy. There was, a, there was a substitution happening at the altar. And through that, you learn that you actually are unloved, that God is taking away your sin. Are you starting to hear the echoes of Jesus at the altar of the physical temple? This is what happens. 
at the altar. It's where you go to confess your sins to the priest. And the priest would take your sacrifice and you would put your hand on the sacrifice. You would take full responsibility and you would accept that sacrifice in your place. And the priest would, would make that sacrifice for you and your sins would be forgiven. You know, the altar was a place of confession, but there were many steps leading up to the altar. There were steps leading up to the, the holy place. The, the, the temple was full of steps. And in Jewish thought, steps represented repentance. And I think for us, sometimes we confuse confession with repentance and we think that they're the same thing. But actually they're not. Confession and repentance are actually different things. Confession is when you realize that I was meant to be walking on this path with God and I've strayed and I need to wake up and realize how far I've strayed from the path. And I need to accept that my sin has hurt God, but God is making it right and God has made a sacrifice to forgive that. Repentance is your response to that sacrifice and you taking the steps to go back to the path. You leave the altar changed and you take the steps back to the path of God. You know, sometimes we, we like to confess our sin to feel better about ourselves, but we don't like to repent from it. We confess so that we get it off our chest. As long as I've told someone about it, as long as I prayed about it, I'm okay, I'm done, I can, I can move on with my life. But you know what happens when we view confession that way? We forget that confession takes place at the altar. That there's a sacrifice taking place that allows you your freedom and forgiveness. That there's a costly sacrifice that is purchasing your freedom and forgiveness. And when we take confession lightly, we forget that confession takes place at the altar. You know, there can be no repentance without confession. Confession is what opens the way towards real change in our lives. But confession takes place at the altar, not at the temple courts. Confession takes place when we realize what God has done to make us holy. I was really encouraged recently uh, to be in a WhatsApp group with some brothers from my ministry. And they were actually just confessing their temptations that they were struggling with, with regards to sexual impurity. And these were singles, these were marrieds. And I was actually inspired to see that. Why? Because they took the sin so seriously that they were actually confessing about the struggle, about the temptations that were coming. And they were saying, can I call you? Can I pray for you? When are you free? That's encouraging for me to see people taking confession so seriously. You know, the other extreme when it comes to confession is that we can feel shame when we mess up rather than guilt. There's a difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is, I've done a terrible thing. Whereas shame is, I am a terrible thing. And those are two completely different positions to be in. You see, when you feel shame, the God that you think is waiting for you at the altar is a God who looks at you like this, who's waiting to judge you. Not a God like this, but a God like this. And when you see God that way at the altar, you will want to run away because you won't want to open up about your sin. You won't want to approach God if that's who God is. You know, confession is such an important part of our Christian lives because it's what allows us to be truly confident in the presence of God, knowing that we are unworthy and sinful in his presence yet knowing at the same time that God is making everything right, that he is making us worthy, that he is making us acceptable, that he is making us loved, that he is justifying us, that on the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ has purified me from my sin and taken that away from me. And the holy presence of God has been torn wide open for me to enter and for God's spirit to come within me. We don't need to run away from God. Why? Because the God that we meet at the altar is a God of this, not a God of this. And because of that, we can come into his presence with confidence. There's a great passage from 1, uh, from 1 John that talks about confession and fellowship. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. 
But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. This says some pretty powerful things about confession. Confession is how we reaccess the blood of Christ, which purifies us of our sin. We all need this as Christians. Why? Because we still sin. I still sin today. I still need to go back to the altar and be reminded of the blood of Christ that has been shed for me. I need to, I need to go back and claim that again in my life. And the passage here is, is saying the way we do that is through confession, because confession is what took place at the altar. Confession is how we renew and practice God's grace, his mercy in our life. It's how we practice that continually that leads us into repentance. Confession opens up that way. It opens up that path to repentance. And here's another interesting thing that it says. Confession brings us closer to God, but also closer to one another. You know, our relationships with one another in the church, the health and strength of our relationships with one another is a reflection of the health and strength of our relationship with God himself. In other words, if there's a problem here between you and I, that means there's actually a problem here between me and God. If you're struggling to love others in the church, if you're struggling to, to serve others, to, to get to know people that are different than you, if you're struggling to forgive others that have hurt you in the church, that have let you down, if you're struggling to be real and to be open with your brothers and sisters, it's not because you're an introvert. I'm an introvert. It's not a problem of introvert versus extrovert. This is a problem between myself and God. This is a, a vertical problem, not a horizontal one. You know, if we are the temple, if we are the place of God's spirit, how are you doing in showing God's forgiveness and mercy to others? If that's what the temple is, if that's a place where people come to the altar and experience God's love, how are you doing in reflecting God's love towards others? You know, it's only possible to show God's love and God's grace to others if you yourself have been deeply moved at the altar by what God has done for you, by what Jesus has done at the metaphorical altar in our hearts. But you know, the danger is that we could come to the altar, we could come into the presence of God, see his holiness and experience his love, and yet we could still leave that place unchanged. You see, God wants us to confess our sin at the altar, but he also wants us to leave it there. Is that you? Has God's forgiveness in your life not changed the way that you see others? You know, if God's love hasn't fundamentally changed the way that you forgive others, the way that you are as a brother or as a sister, the way that you are as a parent, the way that you are as a son or a daughter, the way that you are as a boss, the way that you are as an employee, if God's forgiveness in your life hasn't changed the way that you treat other people, then that means you've left the altar unchanged. You've walked out of the temple unchanged. Is that you? Have you been coming to church for months? Have you been coming to church for years? Being in the presence of God's spirit, not because we are so amazing in this church, but because of what God says about we being the temple. Have you been in the presence of God's spirit, but been leaving that place unchanged? I want to encourage you to be moved by the cross. I want to encourage you to go back to what Jesus has done for you at the altar. I want to close with one final passage. In Luke 18, there's a parable between a tax collector and a Pharisee. And it says this, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, 
God, thank you I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, the Pharisee was inside the temple. He was inside the temple courts, but he did not understand what the temple was all about. He thought it was a place to boast. He thought it was a place to boost his ego and pray loudly and tell everyone about all the good things he has done. But the tax collector was not even allowed inside the temple. The tax collector would have been on the outside looking in. But here's the amazing thing. He was already at the altar because he understood deeply what God's forgiveness and God's love was all about. And that touched his heart. You see, for a tax collector, his whole life he was despised, he was rejected, he was an outcast. But in the temple, in the presence of God, he knew he was worthy. He knew he was loved. He knew he was special. He knew he was chosen. It was so overwhelming for him that he beat his breast. What does that mean? It seems strange. The other time we see people beating their breast in the book of Luke is in chapter 23 when people see Jesus on the cross and they beat their breast out of indignation, out of anger. And he says, have mercy on me, a sinner. The word have mercy in the Greek means something like make atonement for me. Take away my sin, make it right. You see, the tax collector, even though he wasn't inside the temple, he knew exactly what the temple was all about. The temple had become so corrupted in Jesus' time. It was a place for trading and making profit. It was a place for religious leaders to boast about their righteousness. But this tax collector understood the true meaning of the temple. It was a place of God's presence and it was a place of freedom and forgiveness. That's us. We are the temple. Can you be this temple for others? That's our calling. Let's be this temple of God's spirit for others, where we ourselves are personally transformed by God's love. But we also can help others to get a taste for how awesome God is and experience his love in turn. I want to close with a few implications. We are God's temple, which means God has chosen to make us his home. Heaven meets earth in your heart. Being temple means through us, people will get a taste for who God is, his holiness and his love. And finally, how we forgive and love others will reflect whether we leave God's presence and his altar changed or not. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you, Father, that that you have made us your temple, God. Sometimes we don't understand how significant that is, God, that we have experienced your love. We've experienced your mercy at the altar in our hearts, Father, that you have made us worthy of being in your presence, God, that you have brought your, your Holy Spirit into our lives, into our hearts, and you want us to be the temple for others, God. I pray that today as we grasp a deeper understanding of what the temple was all about in the Old Testament and in the time of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that can help us now as a spiritual temple to be able to help others to know you, God, to be able to help others to experience your love and to be able to walk the path with you, Father. Lord, thank you for this time on this Sunday to be together as a church. Pray that we can go out of here and fellowship and be closer with one another, even though we're online still, God. And we pray, Lord, all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.